As the fog lifts from this valley to reveal these links, you can imagine the heritage from the beginnings in the old country and its forefathers from abroad. It's been played for centuries and its origins are claimed by many, but in the United States, it can only be claimed by one. It's here where American golf course history begins. In the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, organized golf began with a small group of gentlemen who wanted a social gathering in 1884. The game had been around since the 1400s in some variety, but in a tiny area known as White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, Oakhurst Lynx started match play and the humble beginnings of golf began in the United States. There's documentation that some form of unorganized golf was played in the colonies. It goes far back beyond Oakhurst or St. Andrews Yonkers. Uh, there's a, there are bills of laden of, of, of golf equipment sent from London into the southeastern states or Charleston or Savannah. Uh, back uh, a long time ago, well, maybe 150, 60 years before, Oakhurst uh, was established. Russell Montague was the only American of this group. He was joined by Scotsman Alexander McLeod and his brother Roderick, George Grant, and Lionel Torin, who lived in Ceylon. How could these men from different backgrounds, from different parts of the world, converge on this small remote spot on the map? Some came to this region for a healthier lifestyle or to be a farmer. Others, maybe, because it reminded them of their native Scotland. Russell Montague was a wealthy, Harvard-educated lawyer who fell in love with the game while studying law years earlier in England. On the advice of a doctor, he, along with his wife and son, moved south from Boston to a healthier climate. In 1880, they purchased property from George Grant, including the 22 acres that was known as Oakhurst Farms. Each summer, George Grant's cousin, Lionel Torin, came to America to visit. Torin traveled abroad with his Hickory Golf Clubs and was well-schooled in the game of golf. Grant didn't want to disappoint his cousin, so the men started talking about making a golf course, and that laid the groundwork for what would become known as Oakhurst Lynx. Mr. Montague uh, offered his property to be the site of the golf course. So construction was commenced, and you can imagine when we talk about construction today, building a golf course, a few men and a few hands on that farm to start preparing uh, what is now uh, Oakhurst is quite unusual, I think. The course was well into the planning stages, but construction didn't begin until Torin arrived from his transatlantic voyage. This course was originally over 2,200 yards, and may have been small by today's standards, but distinctive for a 19th century archaic course. Torin brought his clubs with him, but they needed more than one set. They asked another local, George Donaldson, to bring back clubs while in Europe visiting relatives. When George made the return trip to America and was going through customs, one of the customs officials said, what are these? And George says, those are my golf clubs. The customs official said, what? And George said, golf clubs, man, have you never heard of the game of golf? So they talked to Fraser Corrin, who was a, a very talented carpenter in the area, and said, uh, Fraser, would you try your hand at repairing our clubs? And by the way, do you think you could make us some? Fraser Corrin is thought of as America's first club maker. The home of fellow member George Grant was a short distance from Oakhurst. At this large estate, known as Greycliff, this group had already begun playing on three holes they had laid out prior to the construction of the Oakhurst course. Players were allowed to carry up to five clubs and without a golf bag. Usually, clubs were so hard to come by, those players would often share them during a round. The balls they would play with were gutta percha balls made of a resinous syrup from a tree found in parts of Malaysia. The first competition was held at Oakhurst in 1884. There's no doubt these men were passionate about this strange new game that neighbors laughed at and travelers would sometimes stop to see. In 1888, they began playing for the Oakhurst Challenge Medal. So you can bet they were playing before. I think they played in 
played it enough times that they thought, you know, we need a medal. We need a championship medal. The Challenge Medal is the oldest known golf medal in the United States. This group had this medal made to honor their competition, which was usually held on Christmas Day for six years running. Six years straight is one thing, but Christmas Day in West Virginia, let me tell you, this was some real men, because it can be some pretty tough weather out there. If Montague was supposedly unhealthy, and he competed in that thing six years in a row, he wasn't too unhealthy. These guys were horses. They also played for it frequently, and sometimes even weekly, according to a carefully recorded journal the members kept. A replica of the sterling silver medal is on display at the USGA Museum in Far Hills, New Jersey. The original still exists, but it's securely locked away. The men of this club adopted a phrase they even had engraved on the challenge medal, far and sure. People would ride up from the old white hotel to laugh and sometimes ridicule this group, but the golfers paid them no attention. However, one time, Montague took exception while on the first tee. The funniest story was when this Reverend Mason rode over from Covington one Sunday afternoon to watch a game, and he, he saw Russell top the ball and miss, and he said, that is so easy, anybody can do it. So Russell, being kind of ticked at him, he handed him a club and he said, here, you know, you have a go at it. So the story is that a hundred strokes later, the Reverend Mason holed out. He handed the club back to Russell and said, this is a science, not a game. Shortly after the turn of the century, this new game seemed to have caught on in the United States. There were plans for a new course in the area, but at the Old White Hotel, now known as the Greenbrier Resort. By 1910, play had started to fade at Oakhurst. By 1913, some of the members left America and traveled back to Europe to be closer to their families around the time of World War I. Whatever the reason was, Russell Montague is quoted in a 1913 article as saying, the boys just drifted away. Shortly after this, the Greenbrier opened a new 18-hole course that would be known as the Old White. George Donaldson and Montague both started playing there, and soon the Oakhurst course fell dormant and remained that way for 80 years. I think they stopped playing on that golf course because the new Greenbrier golf course was new, and it was 18 holes, and probably constructed with significantly more knowledge and more interesting strategies and hazards and so on might have been even that it was flatter. That might have had something to do with it. But uh, the, the newer golf course was better than the one they did. Here, Montague is seen playing at the Greenbrier in 1945. Eventually, he moved away to Richmond, Virginia to be closer to his son, Carrie. Later that same year, the father of American golf, Russell Wortley Montague, died and left his property to his two children. As the years progressed, the only living heir to Russell Montague decided to sell what was left of the Oakhurst farm. A friend of the Montague family, Sam Sneed, heard of Kerry Montague's possible intentions to sell. Sneed also knew Fraser Corin and had visited him while making clubs. Sneed himself was a club maker at the Homestead Resort while working as a young man. Caron, who made clubs for these guys, probably translated by word of mouth information that nobody else would have been privy to other than Sam Sneed. So I think that Sam is an authentic piece of documentation that has to be accepted for that reason. Sneed played golf often with Lewis Keller and knew of his interest to find a summer home and a place to possibly raise thoroughbred horses. Conversations would always lead to finding a place close by. In 1959, Sneed told Lewis and his wife Rosalie about the Montague property possibly being available. There were already three casinos in the area. Carrie, who was a practicing minister, didn't want to sell to anyone that would turn it into another gambling establishment. 
the Kellers convinced Montague they wanted a place so the children could ride ponies. Mr. Montague was blind and, and yeah, it, it couldn't see at all and took me by the hand as we had met him and chatted and walked me out on the grass to the first tee, pointed down the fairway as to where the first hole was and walked me across the front of the property. He showed me the ninth hole and the third tee and pretty much gave me some impression as he remembered with the, even his being blind as the holes were on the golf course. With that visit and a gentleman's handshake, Carrie Montague agreed to sell the Oakhurst farm to Lewis and Rosalie Keller. They purchased these hallowed grounds for $17,500. He gave me a number. He refused to accept a deposit, refused to have any contract other than when he would have it drafted and sent to me at my residence. Some artifacts from the farmhouse and the course were packed away and had been taken to Richmond when the Montagues moved from Oakhurst. He was kind enough to give me the first medal that was played for here at Oakhurst. And a lot of personal things, that not only their letters which we kept, but their, the magazines and such dating back to 1903, 1904, that articles written about Oakhurst and about his father and the founding members. He still wanted to raise thoroughbreds and had been warned about the conditions of the property being too rough and steep. If Lewis had listened to these experts and plowed the grounds, the history of golf at Oakhurst and the real history of golf in America would have forever been lost. The Kellers knew the history of the course but had no intentions of restoring it. Longtime friend, and golf pro Gardner Dickinson set up a meeting with Lewis Keller, Bob Cup, and himself at Oakhurst. Cup was a well-known golf course architect who had worked under Jack Nicklaus. He told me about this place. He said, there's a, there's a friend of mine has a, a farm up in West Virginia near the Greenbrier that, that has an old golf course on it that never been uncovered. And I think I want to take you up there and show you. And he finally did. While standing there, overlooking the horse farm, Lewis pointed out the course to Cup and told him the stories that were described to him. He also showed him the artifacts that were found over the years. The Kellers had started entertaining the thoughts of restoring the course, but the raising of thoroughbreds was going extremely well. The name that Oakhurst had made was becoming even more admired in equestrian circles. So popular, in fact, that one day a visitor showed up at Oakhurst and with that random call, the end of the horse farm strangely was in question. Sunday morning, as I was preparing for church, this gentleman drives up and, uh, and asked if, uh, if he could see some of the horses. And he said he was just getting into the thoroughbred business. And he had heard that over there from the Greenbrier that uh, we had horses here and he uh, wanted to take a look. And he said, uh, would you consider selling me uh, one or two of your yearlings? And I said, well, I'm not quite sure. I said, I, I will give it some thought. So that evening was really the decision time. After more than 100 years, it was time to awaken the mystic aura that had walked on Oakhurst Farms. Lewis had made a promise to carry Montague to preserve the memory of the Montague family. Bob Cup had offered his services earlier for this project, but it wasn't until Lewis and Rosalie had made up their minds about selling off the horses that his services would be needed. This was not a, an economic venture at all. This was a very personal thing, and I just finally called Lewis one day and said, I think we could, I think we ought to try to find it. The remaining documents and artifacts that weren't at Oakhurst had been kept for years in the garage of the widow of Carrie Montague. Mrs. Montague, after she got back to Richmond, Virginia, and they were unpacking, having left the property at, at, here at Oakhurst, they, uh, she called me and said they had uncovered uh, uh, the, the original clubs and that if I would stop by Richmond and pick them up, that was a gift. I had planned to be in Richmond on a given Monday morning to 
received this one of these, this great gift of the, the clubs, and she called early Monday morning. The garage had burned down and the clubs were destroyed. But they were the original clubs that they played with here at Oakhurst. All that was left of Oakhurst was indeed at Oakhurst. So the discovery process began. The fields were heavily overgrown, and a fence that was used to keep the horses from coming too close to the house divided the middle of the course. The course was overrun, but virtually undisturbed. At the very first, it was kind of like walking anywhere else, any other golf property. But as we walked, and as it started to sink in, what had gone on there a hundred plus years ago, uh, it got a little bit emotional. Lewis also had the first-hand accounts from being walked around the grounds by Carrie Montague when he purchased the fabled property. But it was the nostalgic pieces and those memories that had to be used to begin the uncovering project. Without the items that were lost in the fire, the assembled team had very little that was printed or written down to go on. Of course, they had Sneed's memories and the stories that were handed down to him from Fraser Corrin and Keller's knowledge from Carrie Montague. It was a moving experience that I didn't know I was going to have when I went up there that particular trip. And it was after that that we went with the boys to get after the dirt. But I had enough time to relay to them how important it was that we do things intelligently, that we work toward an authentic affair. This is not a design project. This is about history and uh, honoring the, the, those ghosts and the Lewis Kellers and the Sam Sneeds of the world. That was a very emotional thing for me. After several months of preparation, the actual physical work began in the spring of 1994. Bob Cup and his crew who made the journey north from Atlanta began to literally uncover history. With Sneed in his 80s, he wasn't able to get around the property, but was very active in the process. Sam used to make regular visits here to be with Bob Cup and the men, check on what was being done, talk to them. He was very interested in, in everything we did and was a great asset. But all, we found all the elements and the bits that were there. Pulling back the turf, finding blackened soil where they had obviously dumped manure to fertilize grass, also told me that perhaps there was grass on those grains. As life was being breathed back into Oakhurst, it became evident that golf was played here. Elements of the game and course design started to be noticed as well. This group of men in the 1800s, with no background in course design and very little background in the game itself, had shaped a course using the terrain and with principles that are still used today. Keller's target date of completion was October 20th, 1994. It was the week of the Solheim Trophy at the Greenbrier when the American team was playing the English team with the ladies. And Dick Taylor arranged to have the writers that were covering the event here that morning for the inauguration. In front of the international golf press and an audience anxious to see this day come to fruition, Sam Sneed was asked to take the ceremonial tee shot. Sneed, after all, was the pivotal figure in tying this remarkable puzzle together. A special club was made for this historic event by Ping Golf. Sam and Karsten Solheim sat on the patio as the press arrived. When it was time, Sam stepped into the shade of the number three tee box. And up comes this, basically what appeared to be a seven wood with something that looked like a hickory shaft, but the head was absolutely glistening like the hood of a car, solid black. I mean, it was beautiful. Sam looked at it, swung it a couple of times, walked up, lined up his shot, and there was a little breeze blowing from right to left, and he 
took the club back just as perfectly as could be, and it came down, and there was a horrendous sound, a crack, like you very seldom hear. And <laughs> there were two things headed for the green, <laughs> and I was mortified. I thought, oh, no, after all of this, Sam turned around to me, and he said, quote, did either one of them get on the green? <laughs> they didn't know that prior to Sam hitting that shot, he asked me to go into the golf the club room with him, and he wanted to take a look at all the irons in there. Sam took about five of the clubs, looked down the shaft at every one of them to be sure that he got the straightest hickory shaft. And the next one, Sam hit it so perfectly. I mean, it was picture perfect. The ball arced up, made a little slight turn to the left, and drifted right in on the stick. I mean, it wasn't 10 feet away, and the place came apart. There was plenty of evidence that pointed to Oakhurst being the original organized club, but some have doubted the distinction as the first course in America. St. Andrews, which first started in 1888 in Yonkers, New York, had long been recognized as the first golf club in the States because it's the oldest club in continuous operation since being formed. In 1897, St. Andrews moved its course to the current location of Hastings-on-Hudson, New York. Now, it so happened that the Apple Tree Gang, which is what uh, came out of it, known later as the St. Andrews Yonkers Club, which were just uh, people who would gather around uh, a, farm, a farmhouse or a country home and hit shots out in the, into the yard. And it grew and it was established into a, into a club. Now, Oakhurst was much the same. And I think it's important that we as a West Virginian, certainly I feel this, uh, some historical pride in the, in the fact that the game was played here as a, as a, as a game, as, as a, using Scottish rules, you might say, because the USGA rules to this day relate back to the game across the water. We outdate the other golf courses totally in the United States. Mr. Montague uh, and his group in 1884 were indeed the first golf course and the first golf actually played here. The other courses follow in history. The United States Golf Association was formed in 1894. Lewis Keller had to prove to the USGA that Oakers could rightfully claim the honor to say they were indeed first. I believe that their feeling is that there's been sufficient information, there's sufficient history, that we have outdated St. Andrews, and Oakhurst is unquestionably the oldest golf club in the United States. It took some time, it took some effort, and it took a lot of work in, uh, to bring to date that, that information. In 2001, Oakhurst was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Several months after Oakhurst was open for public play, the USGA approached Lewis Keller about making it a working and operating museum. Lewis declined their offer. He wanted it played as it was more than 100 years ago, with vintage clubs and gutta percha type balls, but more importantly, as a golfing experience. It just sort of fits in the whole narrative that, that, that Sam's need takes Lewis Keller there. Somehow that just seems appropriate, you know, that, uh, uh, that as you, you follow the line of this story, uh, you know, K Keller is taken by the Greenbrier, comes here frequently, and then it's, it's uh, literally, because by the time this is happening, Sam Snead in the, in the late 50s is a fairly legendary character, and, uh, and so that, that he, he is the connection somehow seems appropriate in this, in this uh, story that ties all the way back to the beginning of golf in America. It's possible that the growing popularity of the Greenbrier Resort also played a role in the Oker story living on and getting retold. Journalists would visit the Greenbrier to write about the young phenom on the tour, Sam Snead, with Russell Montague playing at the Greenbrier even up close to the time of his death these journalists had the opportunity to hear first-hand accounts about the group who started the original golf course and club in America and interview one of the founding fathers directly. 
In Sneed's case, you know, it really brings the, the Greenbrier to national and eventually international notoriety, which I think also brings a lot more interest uh, to, to Oakhurst. You know, and kind of looking at all this, um, it seemed very possible to me that Oakhurst would have just faded away and literally, literally be forgotten. If Kerry Montague had sold his father's property to someone other than Lewis and Rosalie Keller, the story of Oakhurst may have just been a story, almost a fictional place. Lewis Keller was the person who had the foresight to literally uncover history. I do believe the history would have been erased. It would have been eradicated because it would have gone back, it would have remained at St. Andrews in Yonkers, New York, which was not the accurate site of the game. The story of Oakhurst started less than 20 years after the completion of the Civil War. This tiny spot, nestled in the foothills of the Appalachians, had a huge impact on this international game. The history of golf in America began here at Oakhurst. The golf has so much potential, so much flexibility, so much variety that it's a shame not to express it. And Oakhurst is as much of an absolute expression as Augusta National is. You read the, the, the history books on golf, that's what you find. So I, I'm uh, not making any campaign of it personally, but you've asked the questions, and I, and I put to you that I think it's important that you and I and everybody else knows about Oakhurst has an obligation, if not to anybody else, certainly to uh, Oakhurst uh, founders and Lewis Keller and to the state of West Virginia to talk about it because it's, uh, it's, it's a part of the history of the game we should be proud of. But it won't be in the history books unless we make sure someone talks about it. Oakhurst Lynx was constructed by hand to pass the time in these rolling hills of West Virginia. Four Scotsmen and one American are the ancestors to American golf courses today. It traveled with some of them nearly 4,000 miles to this new land, this valley. More than 100 years passed from the time Oakhurst was formed in 1884 until Lewis Keller uncovered it. Now the links, which consisted of the pastures that the founding fathers of American golf walked on, have passed through hands to another caretaker. The land was auctioned off in 2012, only to sit idle again.